There is a kingdom coming here today. There is a kingdom coming here today. We wait, believe, our God is alive. There is a kingdom coming here today. There is a stirring in the soul. gathering of people in process, a place where the curious and the unconvinced, the skeptical, the used to believe, and the broken, along with those who are committed and informed and sold out, come together around the claims and the person of Jesus. For those of you who are new among us, uh, my name is Lynn Bayard. I'm uh, one of our volunteer leaders. And uh, we want to, you to be sure that whatever we do today, you're welcome to participate with us in or just observe as you wish. And we'll be uh, probably wrapping up around 1045. And we hope that uh, on your way out, you'll take some time to uh, pick up some lemonade 
and to get better acquainted with someone as well. Uh, there's a change in an announcement in your bulletin. This is particularly for those of you who were planning on the TYF beach trip. That has been replaced. The new actual uh, event is actually the next evening. It's a pool party at the Wilder's house. Uh, that's on the 28th, correct, Eric? At 6.30 in the evening. So strike out the 27th beach trip and put the 28th in at 6.30. So Burger King told us, have it your way. For 40 years, they told us, have it your way. So do you usually get your way? Or uh, around your house, who is it that usually gets uh, his or hers or its way? But what about God's way? Jesus talked a lot about the way things work in God's economy, in his reality. And he told us that the way things work with God can be the way things work in this world. And he invited us to pray for that. He called it the kingdom of God. And later in our celebration, David Smith will be sharing with us uh, a talk on praying kingdom-focused prayers. So now I would invite all of you who are able to stand as we continue our celebration together. Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord our God, you are great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. You cover yourself with light as with a garment. You stretch out the heavens like a tent. You make the clouds your chariot and ride on the wings of the wind. You make winds to be your messengers and flames of fire are your servants. Oh, that our salvation would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores us, we shall rejoice and be glad.
Lord our God, your name is great, you are mighty in the earth. Help teach us to, to speak those words, to, to proclaim your greatness with the way that we approach you and with your love and humility, and reverence and joy, and the way that we, that we talk about you to those around us. You are so great. We see it day by day, minute by minute, in the world around us, in the promises of Scripture. Way that you lean down and show your love, and mercy, and grace to each one of us. We praise you. May we always praise you, never cease. Amen. Please greet one another with the love of Christ. Well, it's uh, great to be in the house of the Lord together, and uh, uh, some of the, there's some great movies out right now, and how many of you have heard of the movie Fireproof or Courageous? All right, anybody? How many have seen it? Many of you have. Well, great quality Christian films. There's another one put out by the same people of Fireproof and Courageous, and it's called War Room, all right? War Room. That's coming up this week, uh, this Friday. It opens up in, in different theaters. I was at, uh, at a theater this week at, uh, uh, what is it, Worcester Cinema North, and they had a big Bible there. It was awesome. It was just a prop, of course, you know. But there it had Come See War Room. So I know they're showing it. Check the theaters around you. It's all about prayer and about really calling upon God in prayer. And so I uh, hope that you can, you can catch it. Uh, it should be a good one. Well, let's uh, come before the Lord as we call upon him in prayer. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly and Holy Father, we, we come to you now in prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus, drawing near to your throne of grace and reverence and awe, for you are a holy and righteous God abounding in love, full of compassion, mercy, and grace. We hallow your great name, O God, for you are worthy of all honor, praise, and glory. You've redeemed us from the pit. you filled our hearts with peace and joy overflowing. You've set our feet upon a rock, have written our names in your book of life in heaven, blessed, Blessed be your name forever and ever. Thank you, Lord, for, for Trinity Church and all the people of this fellowship. We thank you for calling us to be part of this body of yours, looking to you, Lord Jesus, as our head and our commander-in-chief. We thank you for those spiritual overseers that you've placed over us to protect us, and lead us in your paths of righteousness and service for your great kingdom, the kingdom of God. Father, stir us up to be men and women of courage who will take our place in your great kingdom, using those spiritual gifts and talents and abilities that you've entrusted to us for this very purpose, the advancement of your kingdom on the earth. Father, we thank you for the courage and bravery of those three Americans who tackled and stopped the terrorists in France this week on that train, saving and protecting those on board from certain injury and death. Father, grant us courage in living our lives, fighting against evil and against wickedness in high and in low places. Lord, as we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness in our lives, we humbly ask that you would forgive us for our sins against you, Father, 
with sins of hardness of heart, of indifference to the needs of the poor and the needy, the sins of the flesh, to unforgiveness towards others, for stubbornness and pride, for prayerlessness, for our own selfishness and bitterness and for timidity in sharing our faith with others and for other acts and attitudes of rebellion which grieve your Holy Spirit. Lord, we repent and humbly beseech you for mercy and for grace. Father, we lift before you Christopher Roy and serving of people's homes and property and saving of the floor and the fauna all around them. Father, send forth rain upon the earth to quench the fires and grant them success in their saving work. We continue to call upon you, Lord, for revival and spiritual awakening, that as we've been singing, we, we pray that by your mighty outstretched hand, you send forth your Holy Spirit to do a deep work among us, opening our eyes and hearts to your holy presence among us, calling us together to a closer walk with you and calling those who are not walking with you to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Send forth your reins of the Holy Spirit upon us in a deep, transforming work of the Holy Spirit. Father, we ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and ask that you'd hear us now as we sing unto you this prayer that, Jesus, you taught your disciples to pray. When we think about staying power for a song that lasts longer than five years or ten years, we have such songs as the one we're about to sing that was written back in 1873, Blessed Assurance. It's a song that's been sung by millions of people, and the story behind that song is, is included in your bulletin, and I encourage you to read that. Uh, the story about a woman by the name of Fanny Crosby. She was blind after six weeks. She uh, was uh, stricken with blindness. And she's written thousands of hymns over the course of her life, and God blessed her with long life. She lived to be the age of 94 before the Lord took her home. So you can find it in 345 in your hymnals. And before we sing it, I'd like to share a brief testimony uh, on how God answers prayer. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, many of you know that our son Luke is uh, riding his bicycle across America 
and some of you are following on Facebook on his, uh, his progress. Well, yesterday Luke called us up and I said, how's it going? He said, well, it's been a little difficult. I said, how is that? Well, Caleb and I are separated. He's somewhere in South Dakota, I think, and I'm in Wyoming. I went, oh boy. And he says, what's going on? He said, well, he lost cell phone coverage so he can't communicate. And uh, I took a wrong turn and, and I thought he was ahead of me and he was behind me and had a flat tire. And I'm at a gas station and we're here at this gas station for, for eight hours. And I don't know how I'm gonna get in touch with, with Caleb again. Well, Susan said, let's pray. She prays for him over the phone. We agree together, hang up and on we go. After five minutes later, I felt led of the Lord to call him up and said, everything okay? He said, Caleb just showed up. <laughs> Isn't that great? So, so praise the Lord for answered prayer. Let's sing together 345, Blessed Assurance. <laughs>
Mark, would you kindly pray as we dedicate this offering to the Lord? Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you have so richly blessed us in your son Jesus, um, not only with the things that we need for life, but Lord, with those things that we are helpless to have in and of ourselves, the, the spiritual things, the, the true life of the kingdom of God, we thank you for that. So Lord, we ask that you would take these things that, that you've given to us to, to meet the, the physical needs of, of other people, to further your gospel, and to glorify your name. And we ask these things according to your son's authority. Amen. Amen. Your church at this time. The Old Testament reading is from Habakkuk, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, which can be found in your pew Bibles on page 1,459. Habakkuk, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on Shigianoth. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One, from Mount Paran. Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand, where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled, and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. The New Testament reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 13 through 21, which can be found in your pew Bibles on page 1,799. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 13 through 21. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we, in our, if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do, no, do, do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Those who are able, please stand for the gospel reading.
which is in Matthew chapter 6, verses 28 through 33. This can be found in your pew Bibles on pages 1,505. Matthew 6, verses 28 through 33. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his holy and inspired word. Thanks, Sandy. Well, this, uh, this summer, if you've been with us, has been a great summer so far in our, our teaching series on the Holy Spirit and revival. And if you've missed any of the services and would like to, uh, uh, to get them, just let uh, Sherry know and we can make sure that you get a copy in some form or fashion. Well, last week we saw that revival is not primarily about having better meetings or being happy. It's about God's name being exalted and more praise and honor being given to him on the planet. And so when we speak of, of revival, uh, our prayers for revival uh, are to, to, to bear this in mind. When framed with scripture, our prayers will be prayers that recognize God's presence that's desperately needed in our lives. Uh, we will pray that his name will be revered in the land and that we will be salt and light going out into the world as his ambassadors. God's chosen people are called to thrive and to testify to the world of God's goodness, his righteousness and salvation as light to the nations, as Isaiah says. Uh, revival begins with that, that realization that God's presence is not being experienced in life transformational ways as it once was in ages past. And from this realization comes this heart cry to God, Lord, we, we sense something is missing here. And we want to ask and implore you to, to pour out your spirit upon us in a way that we would experience you in, in new and wonderful ways. Well, that's what we looked at last week before we dive in today on, on praying kingdom-focused prayers. Let's pray uh, that God would uh, direct us. Oh Lord, we ask that you would bless now the preaching of your word. Send forth the Holy Spirit upon both preacher and hearer. May your word have great success and effect in our lives. For we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, the issue in the Church of Jesus Christ in America today from my perspective, is not that we're not praying. Because I believe that we are praying. As I listen to people pray in prayer meetings and gatherings, I sense that there is a lot of prayer going on in the church in America. But the issue that I like to take up with our prayers is how are we praying? And what are we praying for? We pray for ourselves, we pray for our needs, and we see them and the needs of others, but we're miserably falling short in our praying the kind of prayers that focus in on God's kingdom and praying for righteousness, God's righteousness in our life. John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, put it this way. He said, you can do more than pray after you have prayed. 
but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Prayer is the most significant, most necessary task given to us as followers of Jesus Christ. We can do more than pray, but we cannot do more than pray until we have prayed. Jesus says to his disciples when they said, Lord, teach us to pray. He said this, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. They think they'll be heard with their many words. Do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you before you ask him. Pray like this, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This prayer is a kingdom-focused prayer. When we pray kingdom-focused prayers, we begin by reverencing and hallowing the name of God, and we seek the advancement of his kingdom on earth. As it is in heaven, may that be here on earth as well. It's not primarily about our needs as individuals. It's primarily about the kingdom. It's all about the kingdom. Well, it's not that God doesn't care about our needs. He does. He says, you know, pray, give us this day our daily bread. Bring your needs that you have. I need help with my studies. I need help raising these kids. Lord, I need strength to deal with this obstinate husband. Whatever your prayer is, Lord, he answers those prayers. And he wants us to offer those prayers up to him, those specific prayers we have for healing and such. But before we give our long list of, Lord, this is what I need from you, God says, begin this way. Reverence my name. Hallow my name. Seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 6 and verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, And all these things shall be added to you. The other things that we need, God will take care of those things. Clothing, places to live, education, and so forth. But we need to put first things first. And the first thing is, Lord, it's all about your kingdom. It's all about you and your righteousness. And Lord, I know you'll care for me and my family and the needs that I have. I lay that at at the foot of the cross. But Lord, my prayer is, may your kingdom be advanced today. Revival prayers are prayers which seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Revival prayers are praying for the holiness of God in advancing his great name on this earth. Andrew Murray was a a great uh, uh, writer and also South African revivalist. He lived uh, in the 19th century and he said this, revival is a revolution Casting out a spirit of worldliness and selfishness and making God in his love triumph in the heart and the life. Well put. Praying for revival locally and around the four corners of the earth is calling upon God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son to pour out his Holy Spirit upon us, to cast out our worldliness, to cast out our selfishness such that God triumphs in the heart and the lives of his people, that his righteousness and his holiness, that his kingdom would be welcomed, embraced by all. So we pray, Lord, revive us again, that your kingdom would be advanced. Well, Reverend Duncan Campbell, a Scottish preacher, much used to the Lord in the revival in the Hebrides, in, uh, uh, in Lewis, particularly in the island of Lewis, he said this, the revival of 1949, Revival is a community saturated with God. Think about that. A community that is saturated with God. The presence of God is experienced and people not only talk about God, but they, their lives are revolving around God and there's this sense that God is here. God is in the place. Well, he says further, I would like to make it perfectly clear, Duncan Campbell does, what I understand of revival. When I speak of revival, I'm not thinking of high pressure evangelism. I'm not thinking of crusades or special efforts convened and organized by man. That is not in mind, that is not in my mind at all. Revival is something altogether different from evangelism on its higher, higher, 
highest level. Revival is a moving of God in the community, and suddenly the community becomes God conscious before a word is said by any man representing any special effort. Well, let's have that map there. See in the yellow area, that would be uh, the, the islands there of the Hebrides uh, off uh, to the north of, of Scotland, off from the mainland. So when we speak about this revival in 1949, those that trying to get the geography straight, this is, kind of, this is where we're talking about. Well, in 1940, and there's a picture here of the landscape. There it is, beautiful area. I don't know if you've ever been to Scotland or the Hebrides. If you have, talk to me after the service. I'd love to, to hear what it was like for you. I have not. In 1949, the Hebrides Islands and the island of Lewis, off the shores of the mainland, Scotland, two women began to pray for revival. And Duncan Campbell speaks about these two women. Now, he says this, now I'm sure that you'll be interested to know in November of 1949, this gracious movement began on the island of Lewis. Two old women, one of them 84 years of age, the other 82, one of them stone blind, were greatly burdened because of the appalling state of their own parish. And there's a picture of the two ladies there uh, next to Duncan Campbell. It was true that not a single young person attended public worship. Imagine now, here at Trinity, we have a number of young people here with us today, children of all ages. Imagine now, in the church service, not a single youth. No young adults, no youth, no children. That was the state in this church. They sp the, the youth spent their day perhaps reading or walking, but the church was left out of the picture. Those two women were greatly concerned and made it a matter of special prayer. They were gripped by a verse of scripture from Isaiah 44, 3. I'll pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I'll pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. They were burdened to pray as they read that scripture. Both of them, twice a week, on Tuesdays they got up on their knees at 10 o'clock in the evening, remained on their knees till three or four in the morning. Two old women in a very humble cottage calling upon God, Lord, send forth your spirit, bring forth revival and bring youth into our church. We pray there be a change, there be a conversion and you do a deep work of your spirit in our community and so they pray. Well, one night, one of the sisters had a vision. Now, Duncan Campbell says, remember, in a revival, God works in wonderful ways. A vision came to one of them, and the vision, she saw the church of her fathers crowded with young people, packed to the doors, and a strange minister was standing in the pulpit. A strange meaning someone who was not part of their community, someone from a different place, who was Duncan Campbell. And, and she was so impressed by the vision that she sent for the parish minister. Of course, he, knowing the two sisters, knowing there were two women who knew God in a very wonderful way, he responded to their invitation and went to the cottage. Well, others began to join these two women praying for revival. And God sensed and called them uh, to, to call Reverend Duncan Campbell from the mainland in Scotland. And he records uh, his, his coming to, uh, to Lewis. I'll never forget the night, Duncan Campbell says, when I arrived in the piers in the mail steamer. I was standing in the presence of the minister, whom I'd never seen, two of his elders that I never knew. The ministers turned to me and said, I know, Mr. Campbell, you're very tired, and you've been traveling all day by train and then by steamer. I'm sure you're ready for your supper. All right, it's 9 o'clock at night, all right? <laughs> And, uh, and, and after your supper, then bedtime. But I wonder if you could come and address the meeting in the parish at 9 o'clock on your way home. It will be a short meeting, <laughs> and then, the, then we'll make way for the manse. And you'll get your supper and bed and rest until tomorrow evening. Well, Duncan Campbell says, it would interest you to know that I never received my supper. We got to the church. It's about quarter till nine. We find 300 people gathered. 
I would say about 300. I gave an address. Nothing happened, really happened during the service. It was a good meeting, a sense of God, a consciousness of the Spirit moving, but nothing beyond that. I pronounced the benediction. We were leaving the church. It was about a quarter till 11. Just as I was walking down the aisle, thinking, now I'm going to get my supper, I'm going to get a bed night. He's walking down the aisle, the end of the meeting. A young deacon suddenly stood in the aisle and looked up to heaven and said, God, you can't fail us. You can't fail us. You promised to pour water on the thirsty and the floods upon the dry ground. God, you can't fail us. Soon he's on his knees in the aisle. He's praying. He falls into a trance. Understand, it's a supernatural thing. It's uh, some extraordinary things happen during days of revival. Well, the doors open. It's now 11 o'clock. The church opens and the local blacksmith comes into the church and says, Mr. Campbell, something wonderful has happened. Oh, we were praying that God would pour out water on the thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. Listen, he's done it. He's done it. When I went to the door of the church, Duncan Campbell said, I saw a congregation of approximately 600 people. It's 11 o'clock at night now. <laughs> Where did they come from? You saw the picture of the community. It's not, a, it's not a dense city now. This is the countryside. Where did all these people come from? What had happened? I believe that very night God swept in Pentecostal power, the power of the Holy Ghost. What happened in the early days of the apostles was now happening in the parish of Barvis. Over 100 young people were at a dance in the parish hall. They weren't thinking of God. They weren't thinking of eternity. They were thinking of having a good time in a dance. God was not in their thoughts. Suddenly the power of God fell upon the dance. The music ceased. In a matter of minutes, the hall was empty. They fled from the hall as a man fleeing from a plague, and they made for the church. Well, imagine now, 100 young people and a dance. They're having a great time, and suddenly the Spirit of God comes upon them, and they say, we have to leave this place, and they all leave like it's a plague. And where do they go? They find their way to this church. And there they are. It's 11 o'clock at night. Duncan Campbell thought he was going home to get his supper, and they're all waiting for him as he leaves. Well, 10 days of meetings Duncan Campbell was called to do. These 10 days turn into three years of revival in the Hebrides from 1949 to 1953. After years, after the revival and the converts, they had staying power. They went on with the Lord, and many of them went on to Christian service and served around the world. Nearly 75% of the people converted to Christ were converted before they even entered the church. Before Duncan Campbell even preached, they were, they were converted to Christ. Amazing. The true church of Jesus Christ theologically and intellectually believes that Jesus is in our midst. Where two or three are gathered, he said, there I will be in the midst of them. But somehow... The church is failing to experience the presence of the resurrected Christ in life-changing ways. It's as if the Lord's presence is distant or removed from our experience. We leave the church. What was it like? How was service? Did you experience God today? Were you touched by the Lord? Did you feel his presence in your life? Do we go from this place saying, God was there. I met with God. I experienced him clearly. Or do you go away saying, well, singing was pretty good. Sermon was about par. Prayers were okay. What do we leave this place saying? Are we gripped with the presence of God? In a revival, when God pours out his spirit upon us, there's no doubts. There's no doubts. We've experienced the living God. In revival, this great divide is crossed as God's holiness and power break forth in the consciousness of men and women in ways in which human personalities and programs are overshadowed with the presence of God in the meetings and the lives of his covenant people and also before the unconverted in the community. So we'll leave and say, who is preaching? I don't remember the guy's name. 
I don't remember what he looks like. Who was singing? I don't know. I don't know. But boy, God was there. I experienced the Lord. That's what happens in a revival. It's not about personalities. It's about the Lord. To pray prayers which ask God for God's will to be done, advancing his holy kingdom on earth. Are prayers that go beyond the typical, Lord, bless me. Bless me. Meet my needs. To Lord, send forth your spirit that your kingdom would be advanced. Revival prayer is prayer which is kingdom-centered prayer. Prayer which seeks first the advancement of God's kingdom above all else. Now, this may be a shock to some of you, but it's not about you. It's not about me. I'd like you to say that with me. I know for some of you it may be the first time you, you, you thought this thought, but say it with me. It's not about me. It's not about me. Now look at the person next to you. It's not about you. It's just not about you. Look to me. Say, David, it's not about you. Go ahead. It's just not. It's not. What is it about? It's about God's kingdom. It's all about his kingdom. About how that we can see his kingdom come, his will being done in the lives of people here in Bolton and around the world. We don't only look at this community or the other communities that we come from. We look, Lord, work here, but also around the world. It's all about your kingdom. We pray with a cause that's bigger than ourselves. And this cause is the kingdom of God. A key to praying for revival is to learn to pray God's heart. And God's heart is given to us all throughout the scriptures. Isaiah 44, 3 says this, Lord, you promised in your word that you'll pour out water upon him that's thirsty. Send forth floods upon the dry ground. You'll pour out the Holy Spirit upon us. Send forth your blessing upon our offspring. So looking at the scripture and praying that kind of prayer is a kingdom-centered prayer. Send forth your spirit upon us in power. Saturate our lives with your holy presence. Cast off a spirit of worldliness and selfishness. And may you, Lord, in your love and in your holiness, triumph in our hearts, in the lives of your people. Take 10,000 souls and make them your own. That's the kind of prayer that God's calling us to pray. Kingdom-centered prayers. Or as Habakkuk says, in this kingdom-centered prayer, Habakkuk 3 and verse 2, Lord, from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, Lord, I heard the report about you. I stand in awe of your deeds. Revive your work in these years. Make it known in these years. In your wrath, remember mercy. Now, that's a kingdom kind of prayer. That's a revival kind of prayer, isn't it? That's the kind of prayers that God's calling us to get out of the, the typical Lord bless me prayer to the Lord. I pray a kingdom-minded prayer. I pray, Lord, that you would work in this way, not only here, but globally around the world. Next week, I'll be speaking about the coming world revival that the scriptures speak about. So I hope that you're here for that message. Well, let me contemporize this kingdom-centered prayer, uh, if I may. Let me just pray briefly, and then we'll continue on with the sermon. So let's close our eyes and pray this prayer in the middle of our sermon. Lord, I, I, we've heard the stories of how you've moved in great power in the revival of 1949 in the Hebrides Islands of Scotland, answering the prayers of those elderly women using such servants as Duncan Campbell. Where nearly the whole island was converted to Christ, 75% of those before Duncan Campbell even preached a word. Lord, we have heard the reports of great conversions to Christ occurring today in China, in Saudi Arabia, and Nepal, where the church is growing amidst great persecution. Lord, we have heard of the great prayer revival in New York in 1859 and other spiritual awakenings with the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we have heard of your deeds in the history as recorded for us in the Bible where the whole city of Nineveh was filled with godly sorrow, convicted of their sins, repented before you under the preaching of your servant Jonah. Lord, we stand in awe of your deeds and beseech you to revive your work now in this place, here at Trinity Church, 
and in the homes which dot the landscape of our communities, in your perfect holy judgment upon us, in your wrath, remember mercy. Pour out your Holy Spirit, your grace, and revive your work, Lord, to the glory of your great name. And may your hallowed presence grip our hearts with a deep work of the Spirit. May your kingdom come, and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Now I'd like to, to highlight the last phrase that we just prayed. May your hallowed presence grip our hearts with a deep work of the Spirit. May your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray for revival, we pray for God to do a deep work among us. Now that's the kind of prayer that someone who is a, is a growing Christian prays. We understand for someone who's not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, this kind of prayer seems kind of like irrelevant or meaningless or confusing. Well, if you're in that, if you're in that camp, Look at the supernatural power of God at work and see that he is working in extraordinary ways and may that urge you to say, maybe God is alive, maybe he is real as we see his supernatural power at work. Well, in 1949 in the Hebrides Islands, there was a schoolmaster. After looking over his papers 15 miles away from the island on the mainland, suddenly was gripped by the fear of God. That's what happens when revival comes. Those that are not yet believers are gripped with the fear of God. He said to his wife, Wife, I don't know what's drawing me to Barvis, but I must go. His wife said, But it's nearly 10 o'clock, and you're thinking to going to Barvis? I know what's on your mind. <laughs> I know you're going to have a drink, and you're not leaving this house tonight. That was what she said to him. He was a hard drinker, you see. He said to his wife, I may be mistaken, but if I know anything at all about my own heart and mind, I think I say to you now that the drink will never touch my lips again. She said to him, well, John, if that's your mind, then go to Barbas. He got someone to take him to a ferry and someone to ferry him across. And I was conducting a meeting, Duncan Campbell said, in a farmhouse at midnight, and the schoolmaster came to the door. They made room for him in a matter of minutes. He was praising God for his salvation. And that's a miracle. It's a supernatural miracle, the moving of God. Even a person that is not a believer has to wonder if that's just, there's something extraordinary there. That's not religion as normal. I mean, here's a person, he, he's just, you know, reading the paper, sitting at home, and suddenly this thought comes to him, I have to go to Barbas. His wife says, I know what kind of person you are. You're going to drink. No, no, well, it wasn't drinking that was on his mind. It was God. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this in the Bible, we, for, uh, for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each person receive what has been done in the body, whether good or bad. Each of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us. And for someone who's not ready for that judgment, the fear of God comes upon them and they say, I'm not ready, Lord. Be merciful to me. Be merciful. Be merciful. The Bible says that Christ's love compels us. Are you compelled by the love of Christ? Does God's, the love of Jesus, compel you to share the hope that lies within you. If you do, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's to be normative for us as Christians that it's, we're so gripped by the love of God for us that it compels us to go out and implore people to be reconciled to God. I love what Paul says, you know, if I'm out of my mind, <laughs> if I'm out of my mind, he says, you know, uh, I do it for God. If I'm in my right mind, it's for you. Sometimes you may feel a little bit uh, out, of, out of kilter when you just say, I just have to share my faith with you. You'll think I'm out of my mind here, but I just have to. Listen, listen to the Holy Spirit's prompting in your heart and respond to that. The church in America will never see revival until we acknowledge that we need God's Spirit. We need His holy presence poured out upon us. We'll never see revival until we do that.
there was a man from China, and this man was persecuted for his faith greatly in China in the modern day. And he found his way to America, and what happens in American churches, sometimes you find someone like this, you, you bring him into your church and share your testimony. And he became kind of the, the focal point, the limelight, you know, the drawing card to bring people back to the church. Here are this testimony, a guy who was persecuted for his faith. Well, after a year of doing the circuit from church to church, uh, one pastor said, you know, uh, brother, could you share what your experience was like in the American church? Hoping, fishing for a little bit of compliment of, of some sort. And, he's, and he, he hesitated to answer. He said, no, speak candidly. Speak honestly. What was it like for you traveling in the American church? Was it a blessing for you? And the Chinese Christian brother said, well, I can truly say I'm amazed at how much you do in the church of Jesus Christ here in America without God. Wow. What an indictment. Are we just moving through, spinning our wheels in our church service in our own flesh? May God help us to be filled with his spirit and to pray fervently for revival that he would break forth in this church and in this country in a way that he longs to do. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we desperately need you. We're tired of going through the motions. We don't want to do church as normal. Another routine, another prayer, another altar call, another song, another sermon, ho-hum, on the way we go. How this must grieve your Holy Spirit. Father, give us a fervency in our prayers to cry out like these two elderly women did, looking at the emptiness of their church, seeing no young people at all. Father, as I look at the demographic of the homes around us in our different communities, there's no reason why this church should not be filled to the brim. There's no reason why we shouldn't have multiple services here with all the need and all the people. There's no reason why every church should not be filled to overflowing. There's so many people in our area. Oh God, send forth a revival and may it begin with us. Give us a desperation in our prayers. Give us a change of course that we would pray not it's all about me, but we would pray, Lord, it's all about your kingdom. May your kingdom come and may your will be done here on earth even as it is in heaven. Saturate us. Saturate our communities with your presence, O oh God. Rend the heavens and come down.
be a generation of people who seek the face of the Lord. May you be such a person who seeks the face of the Lord in all of your activities, in your prayer life, in your work, in your pleasure, in your giving. May you be that person that seeks the Lord in all aspects of your life. This Thursday at 12 noon, we're going to have a time of prayer here for revival. Is John Smith in the house? Johnny hiding back in the mezzanine? Is he back there? Where's John Smith? Oh boy. I know he's around somewhere. Well, John Smith will be here at, at noon to lead you and join with you in prayer for revival. Is there anyone that can be here with John this Thursday at noon so we have at least someone to join him? Would you raise your hand? Beverly? Colin? Anyone else? We got three? All right. Think about that. Think if you can come join those that we can have at least three or four or five or more calling upon God for revival. Remember these two elderly ladies. They, they prayed and they sought the Lord. If you can't be here at noon, here's my challenge to you. Find someone this week, another person or two, and say, we're going to pray for revival. How about this time? All right? I'm an early bird. I get up at 5 in the morning. All right? What do you say we get together at 4.30? And we'll pray till 5. Then we'll go on to the rest of my day. All right? Think about that. Find someone. That's my challenge to you to pray for revival. Let's see what God will do. Let's see what God will do. I'm excited. I'm hopeful. God has filled me with faith that he's going to break forth in this, in this church in a great way. Will you join me and pray that God would break forth? Has he given you a little bit of faith about this? Our faith is not in ourselves. Our faith is in his word. Our faith is how he's acted in history and how he waits for us to beseech him, call upon him, and see what he will do. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for this time with my brothers and sisters that we can worship you. We pray you would move us forth as we go out into the world. Lead us to those places you want us to go. May we seek your face in all our ways and know that you are with us. And we ask for you to send forth your spirit to do a deep work of your spirit in our lives personally, in the lives of the people, in the homes all around our, our area, that we would be part of this great world revival that is soon to come. We ask this in Jesus' name.